And joining us now on the debate in Berlin, Germany, via Skype, Robert Levine, author of Free Ride, How Digital Parasites Are Destroying the Culture Business and How the Culture Business Can Fight Back. In Chapel Hill, North Carolina, Zainab Tufekci, professor in the School of Information and Library Sciences at the University of North Carolina. In New York, New York, Clay Shirky, associate professor at the interactive telecommunications program NYU. In Syracuse, New York, Milton Mueller, professor at the Syracuse University School of Information Studies. And with us here in studio, Ron Diebert, director of the Citizen Lab at the Monk School of Global Affairs, U of T. Great to have so many of the uh, leading luminaries in this game on our program today. And I want to start with you, Clay, because last Friday, Congress, of course, shelved those two controversial bills that have become known as SOFA, uh, SOPA rather, and PIPA after much protest, <laughs> including that blackout day that uh, everybody who loves Wikipedia experienced. Question, does that mean your movement has dodged a bullet here? Yeah, I mean, we, I think we absolutely did dodge a bullet. I, I, I think for all the for all the sort of good sense of good feeling after last Wednesday that we'd managed to get these bills uh, essentially tabled in Congress, we, we nearly lost it. It really took a long time for the community to understand what was coming. And it wasn't until late last fall that people even began to be active on this movement. Those bills were almost you know, out of committee and passed before we had a, we had a chance to say anything about it. So. Uh, for all that, you know, as you say, for all that Congress got them tabled, we, we're we also frightened because uh, it, it was by no means a sure thing that we were going to be able to, to, to see that threat off. Ron, does that mean the war is over? Well, we may have dodged a bullet, but I think the tanks are still coming. And uh, I, most of my palanists, and I, I know Clay would agree with me as well, that this is one among a, s a sequence of similar bills and legislation, not just in the United States, here in Canada, all over the world. And in fact, it's not just copyright. I mean, we stand on the precipice here of cyberspace really being fundamentally rewritten from the ground up. Uh, not just copyright, lawful access provisions to help with law enforcement and intelligence. There's an arms race in cyberspace. Governments are flexing their muscles. So the whole ecosystem, I believe, is fundamentally transforming. Well, let's keep this military analogy going, shall we? And Milton, I'm going to bring you in at this point. Corey Doctorow, the sci-fi sci sci writer, and the editor of boingboing.com believes that this fight over copyright is but a minor skirmish in a larger war to come over general purpose computers and the internet. You think he's right about that bigger concern? Well, he's definitely right that there is a bigger concern about internet governance and how we do it and how to do it in a way that doesn't destroy the internet. But I wouldn't call copyright a minor skirmish. I think it's uh, one of the fundamental skirmishes. It's it's very deeply embedded in how we use digital objects online. So if you uh, set up an apparatus to block and filter and censor the internet in order to control copyright, uh, a lot of other things fall into the same infrastructure. Zainab, what's your view on that? Well, uh, I think copyright is a very good uh, example of the problem we're facing and it's going to be a big problem because what's happened is we've shifted from a world of atoms to a world of bits and copyright is essentially a balancing act which allows the user to enjoy cultural products while also allowing the company to collect rent from it because the physical objects are not as easily copyable. Now that cultural objects have moved to the world of bits, what we're facing is industries <coughs> who are refusing to update their, their business model and instead of updating their business model they're trying to create draconian laws to control the users because they can no longer control atoms the way they used to and that's the fight that's going on and I think this is just one chapter of it. Robert in which case help us understand why the government wants to or has an interest in regulating the internet at all. How come? Well let me go back for a second. The tanks that you see coming to the internet are coming to defend my human rights. Let me read something from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Everyone has the right to protection of the moral and material interests resulting from any scientific, literary, or artistic productions of which he's the author. That's the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Copyright is a human right. Now it has to be balanced against other human rights. But as far as what the government's doing, the government is enforcing the law. No, I think SOPA and people were, fa were fairly bad. I don't know if they were bad. They were inefficient ways to enforce the law. I think they had some, there were things that were good about them. There were things that were bad about them. But the fundamental cry of the Internet community is that they don't want any laws at all enforced online. And I would go, so, as if I haven't upset everyone already, I'm going to say that I don't think this was necessarily the Internet community so much as 
Google and technology companies. Wikipedia gets money from Google. Reddit is very close to Google. The Khan Academy, which is an educational uh, nonprofit that blacked out, gave a lesson against SOPA that was entirely inaccurate. They get a lot of money from Google. This is about two industries set against each other. And we, the gov- what the government should do is balance the rights of people in the middle. But we have to stop thinking this, about this as the entertainment industry against human rights and start thinking of it as two industries against each other, because that's really what it is. Okay, let's get uh, Milton and then um, Clay in here to tell us, do you agree with the way that Robert has just framed the debate here? Milton, you first. Uh, no, I don't. I think the, the fundamental problem is that the uh, protection of the property right uh, uh, that copyright owners have, first of all, the property right itself has become incredibly distended. Uh, in other words, uh, you're supposed to give people this temporary monopoly over the reproduction of a work in order to encourage them to produce more works, in order to, in order to reward them for... Uh, for their creations, but we've taken copyright and we've tried to turn it into a permanent uh, monopoly that lasts uh, over 100 years, sometimes 150 years, depending on how long the author lives. And worse than that, we've said that the property rights that we give in America are going to now give somebody a claim on how people use the Internet uh, in different parts of the world. In other words, the, the Internet is so global that in order to control it, we've tried to give one government the ability to control IP addresses and domains that are outside of its own jurisdiction. And so that's a, a very novel and uh, some ways dangerous innovation in the mechanisms of government that we have to uh, be wary of here. Clay, though, on the issue of the worldwide, or shall we say, the wild, wild web, are you of the view that there should be no regulating whatsoever? No, of course not. And, and in fact, I, I don't think that the idea, I think the idea that this was the fundamental message of the Internet community holds, holds water because we had this unusual two-slide comparison in which uh, the SOPA and PIPA protests were going on at the same time Mega Upload was being shut down. And there was nothing like the outcry over Mega Upload, the Mega Upload shutdown, as there was over Sopa Pipa. The problem with Sopa Pipa, and I, you know, I think uh, Mr. Levine alluded to it, there being some uh, bad aspects of the law, I'd go further than inefficient. The problem with Sopa Pipa is that it, it imagined an almost unlimited damage to free speech and to due process by users who use sites that have user-generated content. We have, a, we have a current regulation. It's not like cyberspace is unregulated, at least in the United States. We have the Communications Decency Act 230, which spells out a set of requirements for handling user-generated content. What SOPA and PIPA would have done is raise the policing costs for copyright to the point where sites like Reddit would simply have been in such an economically adverse situation that they would either have to modify their practices significantly or shut down. Mm -hmm. And the thing that rallied the community wasn't there should be no rules about copyrights, as we saw from Mega Upload. The thing that rallied the community was the potential for massive collateral damage to free speech. Ron, where are you coming from on this? Well, I think, I think we need to take a step back here and put it in a bit of historical context. If you go back even 10, 15 years ago, if governments had a policy at all about the Internet, and let's face it, most of them didn't, uh, it was primarily a laissez-faire approach. Now, uh, with cyberspace, more than the Internet, telecommunications, mobile phones, uh, penetrating just about everything we do, it's become a critical infrastructure. And so governments are now forced to intervene. And the scale of the problem is enormous. The threats they face are very serious. Cyber crime, cyber espionage, cyber warfare. Uh, what I see, though, are stupid short-sighted policies, frankly. Uh, not only that, the center of gravity of cyberspace is shifting from the north and the west of the planet, where, is it, where it was invented, Silicon Valley, Washington, D.C., uh, to the south, to the east, to China, to India, to countries uh, that lack democratic accountability and transparency, and see what laws are being passed in, say, Canada or the United States as a legitimization of what they are doing for very different reasons. Mm -hmm. So we may want to censor the Internet to deal with copyright problems, a foolish way to deal with it, albeit, uh, but they will say, well, we want to censor the Internet because of religious extremism or cultural problems or threats to the king. And this is something that's becoming really quite profoundly deep and penetrating around the world. Well, we don't even have to go to that many extremes. Zainab, let me bring you in and ask, you know, I understand the reticence to, to get into deep regulation on this issue by governments, but on the other hand, 
governments are under pressure from their citizens to do something about, for example, child pornography or, you know, overly intrusive uh, privacy issues, which the Internet is not particularly good about. Uh, what would you recommend in that situation? Well, uh, I, I'm definitely for laws against child pornography, and this is the example that often comes up. I just don't think we need to have laws that regulate what people can do with all cultural products in a way you don't even have in the physical world. If I buy a magazine and I cut it up and make some new art pro you know, project out of it, I don't have a company breathing my, down my neck telling me I can't do that. So we don't need that kind of draconian laws to fight child pornography. There are very reasonable ways to f do that and we should by all means do that. I'm not arguing that the Internet does not pose jurisdictional problems, but what governments need to do is to try to balance the, the stakeholders, so to speak, the rights of the citizens to use cultural content, their rights to privacy as it may be, and we are seeing a lot of examples in the way the European Union has been handling this. Uh, the problem with the SOPA bill, and that the reason it took so much outrage, it got so much outrage from the internet community, was it was a one-sided bill. It was a bill of the basically most of the entertainment industry without balancing the original uh, intent of the copyright law, which is, once again, the copyright law is not just about protecting ownership of cultural products, it's also a way for people who purchase or rent those cultural products to be able to use them as they see fit. And that's what most people want to do on the Internet, and that's why these bills took so much heat, is that they were one-sided. Mm -hmm. I'm not against all regulation by all means on the Internet. I've called some f uh, for some before, but it has to be done in a reasonable manner. Okay, well, Robert, let's, let's continue the assumption that these were bad bills and that's why they got pulled and there was so much backlash to them. Having said that, these issues that we've been talking about here still exist and aren't going away. So how would you propose to deal with them to, you know, where do you find that sweet all, spot? First of all, let's clear a few things up. First of all, copyright is the engine of free expression. That's not me. That's Sandra Day O'Connor, a U.S. Supreme Court justice. Copyright is supposed to encourage free expression, and there's never been a First Amendment problem found in a court case with enforcing copyright. Obviously, Sopa and Pipa might have been the first, but so far... There have been many efforts, mostly funded by Google, and Lawrence Lessig has been a champion in this, to show a First Amendment copyright with prob problem. That hasn't happened in court. Second of all, when you talk about copyright lasting too long and covering too much, of course it does. Something that's 100 years old should not be in copyright. People aren't sharing 100-year works on the Internet. That's silly. It's a fallacy. You have to get over that. The most popular pirated movie last year was Fast Five. Now, this is not a movie that's unavailable. It's not a movie that's hard to buy. It may be a movie that's hard to watch, <laughs> but I leave that to you. It may be a movie Lux I've never heard of. What's Fast Five about? Uh, you know, I don't know. I haven't seen it, but it's about the most popular pirated movie on the Internet. Huh, okay. The last thing is um, you said that copyright is about balancing the rights of authors and the rights of public. And what, while we're talking about a worldwide regulatory policy, that's a very Anglo-American view. In France and Germany, authors have a moral right to their work. So on one hand, we have people saying, hey, how dare America regulate the world? And the same people use a defense of copyright that is unique to Britain and the US. So if you really want a worldwide policy, you may have to acknowledge that all of continental Europe considers that authors have a moral right to their work. Hmm. So before we go forward and think up ideas, let's get rid of some of these ridiculous fallacies that have kept us from addressing these issues seriously. Okay, Ron wants a word in here. Well, just a very quick point that we haven't addressed yet, and one bad element of, of both of these bills actually, is the way it would download policing functions onto the private sector, a phenomenon Same. known as intermediary liability. Um, it would require the internet service providers, the telecommunication companies, to monitor traffic that goes through their network. And that's not just happening in copyright, it's happening in other areas of internet governance as well. Do they want to do that? Well, they, they, in fact, some of them actually derive revenue from doing so now. There's a perverse logic being set up uh, where they charge law enforcement access to their data because it costs them money. Um, what it does, however, is it creates a kind of privatization of authority. And it's, it's, it really begins to undercut some of the basic foundational constitutive principles that made the internet great especially network neutrality. 
And that's why, for me, this copyright legislation and the issues around copyright are one small element of a bigger piece of a struggle that's going on right now. Clay, uh, that which Rob Levine just said, you want to uh, take a kick at that? Sure. I don't think anybody here is arguing for a single global policy. In fact, I think one of the great strengths of the Internet technically is that all kinds of different networks are allowed to interoperate. Uh, we're plainly in that world legally, and we're not going to get to a place where there's sort of one world policy. So given that I'm in the United States, I think arguing from an Anglo-American position is the kind, of, the kind of regulatory framework that I want to see, not for the whole world, I don't, don't want to be a cultural imperialist, but rather for the United States to adopt. And what was so alarming about SOPA and PIPA was precisely this intermediary liability, the idea of a market-based system for uh, going, after, uh, going after copyright violators without having due process, the idea of a vigilante clause that allowed ISPs to censor their users without giving those users any recourse to respond. And I'm not proposing that, that a response to that system be made global. China would never accept our regulations anyway. Yeah. What I am saying is laws that create that negative an effect on free speech shouldn't, shouldn't be allowed to pass. I mean, it's an, interesting, it's an interesting thought experiment to think, what would it look like if the entertainment industry came forth with a proposed bill that balanced property rights and respect for free speech. It's just that these weren't those bills. Why do you look just, so irritated, well, Rob? Just a, a comment about uh, global standards and regulation. Those of us Canadians on the other side of the U.S. Patriot Act pr provisions, to which our data is actually subject, realize that there are international regulations that need to be dealt with here. I mean, it's, it's okay to talk about it just in the domestic U.S. context, but really we need to address this on a global level. Okay, Milton, let me ask you to come in at this point then and, and answer this. Do we just assume that if we leave the Internet alone and allow it to regulate itself, that it will eventually um, find its own way, find its own mores, its own values upon which most people who use it will agree? But, no. Yes, I think uh, pretty much uh, the, you need to create a new, uh, more globalized, more relaxed and networked legal framework for the Internet uh, because, uh, because of the problem of sovereignty and the problem of fragmenting and partitioning the Internet along national lines. To, to respond to something uh, Divert uh, said, um, it's true that there is a disturbing kind of privatization of the rulemaking and enforcement functions going on, but it's also true that that is, in fact, uh, there's a very good reason why that's happening, and that is because you can either have the sovereigns get together and form some international treaty, which, when you're dealing with countries as diverse as China, India, and the United States, is going to be very problematic, or you can have uh, some kind of delegation of authority to the private actors and try to put the proper incentives on them to, to behave in a way that preserves the freedom of the Internet uh, 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 while responding to some of the problems. So if you look at the way we have successfully dealt with some of the problems, such as child pornography, you can see a, a lot of delegation to private actors, a lot of uh, crowdsourcing of the the identification of the illegal sites and the attempts to remove them. And I think we need to move more in that direction than we do to reassert some kind of uh, purely sovereigntist national law. Okay, Zainab, your turn. Well, uh, I wanted to say that uh, the discussion shouldn't be about, well, will the Internet self-regulate or not? There should really be recognition that now that we've moved into the you know, era of bits where things are easy to copy, it's also on these industries to update their business models rather than try to make felons out of millions of people, which is what they're doing at the moment. And I'm not going to uh, defend that it's okay to pirate everything, but I do need to defend, say, my college students. I'm a college professor, and this is a very widespread practice among college students because they want to share things with their friends, and they do this. And making felons out of every single one of them surely is not the way that this industry sees its future. Uh, there might not be a simple solution. There might not be a single solution either. But they have to recognize the reality of easy copyability of bits and come back and adjust in a way that allows them to have a business while allowing people also to use content either for free speech or to let their friends borrow perhaps the way we could with books or let us do remix tapes we could do with cassettes. Just bring back the kind of rights we did have before 
in the digital age. And they need to do their part, not just leave it on, well, the governments and the internet should solve our business model problem for us. Hmm. I'd like to jump in here for a second Go and ahead, just Rob. point out that, you know, so far in the US, I'm aware of, I think, only a couple people who have been charged with felonies. You said the government has turned your students into felons. I'd like to know how many college students have been prosecuted for sharing media online. The answer is none. A couple of people were prosecuted who were running for-profit criminal businesses. No one has ever been prosecuted for downloading. They've been sued in civil court. But if you're going to talk about what's going on, you should use the correct terms. Could they be considered felons? It's possible, but they have not been in the Justice Department guidelines specifically say that's not what how those laws are being used. I'm just going to make another point. When you talk about this, you're all talking about, oh, this is, you know, the inter entertainment industry versus the people. I don't think that's true. One of the reasons we're able to block child porn is because, and thank God for this, no legitimate business has an interest in promoting it. Right. So let's look at why we can't block copyright. A lot of legitimate business ha businesses have an interest in copyright infringement. <clears throat> Copyright infringement helped build YouTube. We can disagree about how much it was, but copyright infringement helped build YouTube. And if you look at their emails that came out in the discovery in the Viacom case, the people at YouTube knew that. And when Larry Page was asked under oath if he favored buying YouTube, he had some memory problems remembering where he was at that time. And I want to use a Canadian example because we are a bunch of Americans sitting around talking about Canada. It makes me a little uncomfortable. I want to talk about the Canadian Coalition for Electronic Rights is against C11. Sounds like a you know, big constituency of internet users. It must be an important organization. Let me read the members. Console Source, Game Stuff, Gmods, Go Cyber Shop, iPhone Anywhere, Kick Gaming, MC Canada, Mod Central, and My Gaming Mart. Okay, These are point, companies point being, Rob? Right. These are private companies that specialize in modding we, video games. But, I don't have a huge problem Rob, with that. Okay, so Clay, come on in here. No, nobody's, nobody's, nobody's saying Hollywood versus the people. We're saying Hollywood versus the internet community. The internet community so the internet includes, business. yes, the includes internet business. business of, of, venture capitalists. Of course, of course, the internet community includes internet businesses. But many of the people who turned out were not working for those businesses. They are not employed by those businesses. They are not paid by those businesses. So, in as much as this is a clash, it is a clash between business interests and citizen interests. So I, no one, I think, has said Hollywood versus the people. That's, that's not a narrative you're getting from us. The Internet community is made up of all of the participants in the ecosystem, some of whom are businesses, some of whom are individuals, some of whom are nonprofits. But and the fact if, that Google if, donates a million dollar, of dollars to Wikipedia, that must just be a coincidence, right? It's like one of those wacky No, it's things. not a coincidence. They, their businesses are aligned. The fact that the MPAA donates $100 million to Congress is also not a coincidence. Okay, Where do you right? have $100 million is, to Congress? Where's that coming from? There is lobbying on both... That, like, you're dead wrong the, on that. No, the, 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 the well, toast... I, I, I okay, just, Robert, just, stand uh, by, stand by. Let, let Clay finish his point, then I want to hear Milton. Right. right. There, there are lobbyists on both sides. I think the idea that somehow it's illegitimate for people with internet business interests to participate in talking to Congress, but it's legitimate for the MPAA and the RIA to do it. Is never ridiculous. said that. Okay, Milton, your never turn. Never said that. I just want a lobbyist yeah, called the yeah, lobbyist. Yeah, I just. Uh, Fine. I just said. Uh, I think the. You know, the, of course, there is a clash between industries here, but uh, I think that the the framing of the issue in the United States was that uh, this SOPA legislation was defending jobs. And in fact, uh, the, the Internet industries, and they are industries, not just an industry and not just Google, are generating uh, far more jobs in, in my field than, than the copyright industries. Uh, the copyright industries are basically a stronger protection for a given existing copyright is not going to create very many more jobs, whereas uh, the more flexible and open nature of the Internet is indeed going to create a lot of jobs. I'd also point out that our school that, was one of the cite? few. Yes, I, I think it would be very interesting. This, this fact never came out, but I'd take, uh, it's, it's all in the Department of Labor Statistics. Take a look at how many people are employed by the telecommunications industries and by the, uh, the sort of internet service provision industries and hosting industries and compare it to, to the motion picture industry. SOPA. You're talking about telecom. They were not lobbying against SOPA. Telecom was neutral. The other thing is, by the way, AFL-CIO, every single union was pro-SOPA. 
If you're going to talk about the one percent, the one percent was against SOPA. The ninety-nine percent. Yes, but only one. Working people. Fourteen percent of right. the American labor force is unionized. The, the AFL-CIO on these issues and the communication workers of the America are well known as being basically. Uh, company unions that uh, do whatever the, the lobbyists say on this particular issue. I'm sorry to put it that baldly, but uh, the, the union uh, position on this didn't have a lot of clout with people who normally uh, pay attention to such things. But the point I was making is that the education sector came out against it, the domain name registration industry came out against it, the technical community, I mean the hardcore standard setters and so on, the people who actually built the internet, all, you know, were remarkably unified against it. It, it is simply, uh, you're not going to get a lot of traction out of saying that this was just Google and a few uh, industries that benefit from copyright infringement. Okay. I want to talk about this McKinsey mm -hmm. study that just came out sure. recently where they talk about internet-related consumption and expenditures worldwide larger than the GDP of Canada or Spain and growing faster than Brazil. So, Ron, help us with this. How does the growing economic influence of the internet, which is plain for all to see, how do you think that shapes the discussion of internet governance these days? Oh, well, I think it's enormous. And, and I do have empathy for the points that Robert is making about the uh, internet industry throwing a lot of dollars around. I mean, Google itself is a really new and very powerful lobbying influence that is starting to uh, understand the extent to which it must contribute uh, within Washington, D.C. to have its interests heard. And this is a new phenomenon, and it's a major phenomenon because Google's an enormous presence, so I don't disagree there. Uh, what I find it kind of funny is the extent to which this is debated about you know, who is on one side, who is on the other, what is the debate about, when we really should be looking at the bill itself and how stupid the, the provisions were here, especially around censorship. I mean, that, the, the idea that you can address this problem by uh, requiring internet service providers to move the domains from search engines. And going further, I mean, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the extent to which it would actually outlaw circumvention tools, tools that are used uh, by millions of people to get around internet censorship in places like Iran and China. One such tool being Siphon, uh, which happens to be the one that I, have, that I invented at the University of Toronto. Uh, so I can't let this program go by without pointing that out. Um, this is a inherent contradiction in, in internet policy in the United States. Zainab, you wanted to add? Well, actually, that was the point I was going to make, to put the kind of infrastructure that SOPA required, which would basically uh, make us treat everybody as potential criminals before we let them upload anything, to have the kind of, forget the fact that this is really the wrong way to deal with people, to put, to that, to put that kind of infrastructure, to build it into the backbone of the Internet, would make censorship and surveillance much easier in the rest of the world, where it's not just about, you know, which business makes money, but it's about torture and dissent and opposition. So SOPA wasn't, for me, it wasn't just bad idea in terms of how it was implemented in the cultural industries, but I think as it was written, it was a real threat to freedom in all sorts of parts of the world because the infrastructure it required is very, very dangerous and not healthy at all so for you, any democracy, you know, just, not ours, not anybody just, else. Just this week, India, the Indian government, made a request to Facebook, Google, and 21 other companies to remove content that they find culturally offensive in India, one of the world's largest internet populations. That's SOPA, if you will, without the copyright side of it, in India. Who gets I to mean, define what's culturally offensive? Good question. I mean, the, the same question could be asked of Twitter today, which just implemented a system that would remove content based on geolocation so that they can anticipate requests coming from countries to censor Twitter. I mean, this is the direction that we're headed in, and it's a foolhardy direction that's going to break up the, the Internet. Okay, let me pull a fast one here on our director, Michael Smith. Michael, can I play this clip at the top of page five here, the Rebecca McKinnon from her TED Talk? Let's roll that. We'll come back and chat. Roll tape, please. But now we have this new layer of private sovereignty in cyberspace and their decisions about software, coding, engineering, design, terms of service all act as a kind of law that shapes what we can and cannot do with our digital lives and their sovereignties cross-cutting globally interlinked can in, in some ways challenge the sovereignties of nation states in very exciting ways, but sometimes also act to project and extend it. 
it at a time when control over what people can and cannot do with information has more effect than ever on the exercise of power in our physical world. Okay, and that's Rebecca McKinnon at her TED Talk last summer in Edinburgh. And I guess, okay, Clay, let's pick this up. If companies such as Google and Facebook are, as she describes them, the sovereigns of cyberspace, how do the rest of us hold them to account? Well, Google and Facebook are the two really hard cases because those are the two companies that have really become so essential that they almost can't be disciplined by the market anymore. Um, it's very difficult to imagine either a search engine or a social networking service setting itself up to compete head-to-head -head with either of those companies. So we go after one of two things. We either go after their brand. We either say, we're going to complain so much that people simply regard you as being less worthwhile or less valuable if you don't live up to sort of expectations of support for your members. Uh, or we can look to the other sovereigns, the world's governments, to, to regulate in favor of privacy. So, for instance, the, the Germans and now the EU at large um, is coming in with a different attitude towards user privacy than has, than has taken place in the U.S. sphere. But it is exactly as Rebecca said, it is now a fight between essentially two classes of sovereigns. Most of us, even when we can sort of take action against the brands, are mainly looking on from the sidelines because uh, the, the, the level of power and influence both of the nation state and of a handful of multinational internet firms uh, is out of the reach of, of, of individual users. Milton, you've had the most quizzical look on your face throughout that whole answer. How come? Yeah, I think uh, the, the point that I heard Rebecca making was, it was first of all, in terms of uh, Google and Facebook being outside the reach of competition, I actually don't believe that. I mean, Google just started a new uh, social networking site that does compete effectively with Facebook, and you don't have to use either one of them. What, what Rebecca said that struck me that as being extremely important is when these powerful private actors' tools and processes are used to extend the sovereignty of the government. So this uh, unholy alliance, which is usually done informally, such as the attack on uh, WikiLeaks, for example, uh, that's the kind of thing I think uh, is, is very new and we really don't know how to deal with that. When, uh, if Google agrees, for example, to start turning over all of this information it has to the CIA or the NSA so that they can do uh, all of this uh, searching about us and we don't know about it or it's not properly regulated, that's what worries me, not so much well, whether, you know, I'm forced to use Facebook. Milton, they're required to do it by Patriot Act provisions. And going further, they are allowed to, to request, uh, United States law enforcement is, require, is allowed to request to Google data of citizens who are not based in the United States. And this is precisely why exactly. European governments are requiring uh, or passing regulations uh, and I, restricting I their... Uh, Rob, Le Rob Levine, I've got 30 seconds left. You can have it. Okay. However bad you think SOPA was, where was the outpouring of Wikipedians for that? Where was the outrage there? People care more when Google gets them in the streets. And that's the last word tonight. I want to thank all of our guests from being uh, in places all over the world for our discussion tonight. Robert Levine in Berlin, Germany, the author of Free Ride. Zeynep Tufetsky, uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina at UNC. Clay Shirky at NYU in New York City. Thanks a lot, Clay. Milton Mueller in Syracuse, New York at the School of Information at Syracuse University. Ron Diebert, Citizen Lab at the Monk School here at the U of T. Thanks so much, everybody. Appreciate your participation tonight. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.